The Humanity of Vampires in Susie McKee Charnas' The Vampire Tapestry. Vampire fiction made a comeback in the 1970s and has been on the rise ever since. Due to the rising popularity of vampire fiction in conjunction with the height of the second wave of feminism, vampire fiction has taken on a more distinctive role in feminist fiction. The new vampires of this new age of women have altered both fiction and feminism. The Vampire Tapestry, published in 1980, is an early example of feminist science fiction. Susie McKee Charnas, a female author, writes from the perspective of a male vampire. Having Wayland, her vampire, reject many of the classic vampire archetypes, Charnas creates opportunities for open and frank discussions of the role of humans in humanity. Feminist science fiction is an understated and underrepresented form of, of, of fiction. The rise of women in literature has been slow and often marked with delays and setbacks. The stereotypes associated with women in literature are some of the most difficult to break and have acted as an impediment to progress. In a review written by Annie Cranny Francis called Feminism in Science Fiction by Sarah Lefou notes the connections between science fiction and the politics surrounding gender reform. The attempts of women writers to engage in these issues has led to the foregrounding of social relations rather than individual character, which represents a sophistication of the political practice of science fiction. Science fiction has, in recent years, acted as a bridge between what is happening in the text and what's happening in society. Not all science fiction is directly related to social reform, but readers would be remiss if they didn't note the connections of the themes and motifs present in many science fiction texts. Female authors like Tarnas have helped to change the landscape of females in science fiction. Her male protagonist embodies many of the classic archetypal feminine traits and in many ways is a victim of circumstance. The Vampire Tapestry is an example of science fiction due to the nature of the protagonist. Wayland is a biological vampire. He was born and has lived his whole life as a creature apart from humanity. The Wesleyan anthology of science fiction defines science fiction and gives depth and meaning to an otherwise marginalized section of text. This encourages the fundamental ideal upheld by the science fiction authors that science fiction dramatizes the adventures and perils of change. Writers of science fiction conduct long-distance conversations across generations, cultures, social settings, and historical challenges. Due to the science-based nature of science fiction, it would be easy to push the vampire tapestry into a strictly fantasy-based realm of fiction. However, science fiction centers around the notion that, like all complex cultural forms, science fiction is rooted in past practices and shared protocols, troops, and traditions. While this text generally subscribes to the overall themes of science fiction, many of the definitions and examples can be applied specifically to this piece of feminist science fiction. Charnas's novel breaks free from much of what would be considered the shared practices, but she stays true to the cultural identities surrounding the legend of the vampire. Charnas's The Vampire Tapestry is also an example of feminist literature. The nature of science fiction is to encourage its readers to recognize conventional ideas and then set those ideas aside for the sake of the story. In review of LeFew's work, Cranny Francis discusses the issues associated with role reversal and likewise emboldens readers to question the origins of their belief and discover the newness provided in feminist science fiction texts. Cranny Francis states, women writing in science fiction have allowed them to create a world without the social constraints of gender. This utopia has provided women with ways of exploring their construction as corporal subjects, that is, of dealing with the specific bodily demands and requirements of femininity. Charnas reverses the traditional roles of men and women in the vampire tapestry and subsequently allows many of the stereotypes of vampires to fall away from Dr. Whalen. Levune argues for women to continue their pursuit of science fiction writing. Her general observation is that it is a marginalized genre for a marginalized set of subjects. It is clear that she expects women to continue their practice of breaking down literary barriers. Charnas explores the male-female victim-prey relationship Wayland experiences, specifically with Katie D. Groot. Both characters thereby shatter the molds established for them in the majority of vampire fiction. KG attacks Dr. Wayland because he attacks her, and therefore she takes control of the situation. In taking the power away from the male and giving it to the female, uh, Wayland is not only feminized, but De Groot is empowered. By reversing the traditional roles of men and women, Charnas gives Wayland the opportunity to grow from beast to beauty. The time Wayland spends studying and being a part of humanity makes him more like the animals he feeds on. The article supports the concept that Charnas uses her vampire and his relationship to disrupt the preconceived designs that laid out in traditional vampire fiction. 
The vampire tapestry is a non-traditional example of the vampire novel archetype. However, many of the traditional vampire archetypes are highlighted in the early actions of Wayland. Conventional vampire archetypes include things that are reinforced in other fictional texts. Things like speed, strength, um, cunning, bloodlust, fangs, fair-skinned, agelessness, and being immortal are all are all archetypes evident in Wayland and uh, that traditional vampires seem to share. For example, in part one, Wayland uses his cunning vampire skill to lure uh, Katie DeGroote into his car. Uh, Wayland has incredible speed and strength that he uses like that of a predator. His bloodlust drives him to act rashly and attack Katie. Similarly, in part three, when Wayland first meets Dr. Lander, he becomes so emotional at her questioning that he breaks her office chair. Interestingly, in each of these encounters, Wayland is driven by his distinct human emotions, and these emotions encourage him to use his vampire abilities. Wayland's bloodlust proves to be the biggest of his vampiric problems. He must have human blood in order to survive. This bloodlust is a twofold problem. First, he looks like his food source. While this doesn't seem to be an inconvenience, it makes it easy for his victims to trust him. It does make it difficult for Wayland to separate himself from his prey. He is superior. He is a superior species in almost every way, but he is forced to hide his uniqueness out of fear of the reaction of the general public. Second, he struggles because he shares the same emotional palate as his quarry. He distances himself, trying to see them as nothing but a food source. However, as the text elaborates, he begins to feel both in general terms and for his victims. Turnus takes something vital away from Wayland when she allows him to feel for his victims. Wayland breaks many of the vampire archetypes that he exemplifies, or as many vampire archetypes as he exemplifies. The novel supports, through direct character action and dialogue, the rejection of the traditional male archetypes. While very strong, Wayland is not supernaturally stow, and his body is not immune to the damage from ordinary weapons. In part two of the text, Wayland is taken captive and held against his will by Roger. He is eventually freed by Mark, but only after he is subject to physical discomfort and emotional abuse. Charles created Wayland as a male destined to challenge the roles of men in the realm of men and beasts. In each, of this, in each section of the novel, Wayland becomes less of an empire and more human. By the end of the text, he can no longer see humans as cattle and is forced to acknowledge his humanity. On page 161, Wayland admits his sessions with Dr. Lander are scaring him. He worries uh, the seductiveness and the distraction of our human contact worries me. I fear for the, ruthfulness, or the ruthlessness that keeps me alive. With each passing human interaction, Charnas gives Wayland more humanity, and these interactions detract from his ability to kill without mercy. Wayland is forced to confront his feelings, and he resents Dr. Lander because of what he finds. He says, I resent your pretension to help or to teach me about my, myself. He fears the humanity he is finding in himself. So humans are the world's greatest and worst asset. Um, our humanness is what brings people together after tragedy, but it's also what causes war and conflict. The conflicting emotions of mankind are also felt by Wayland and in many instances are stronger in him than in the average human. Uh, music is often referred to as a universal language and is used in the text by Charnas to bridge the gap between Wayland and his prey. Charnas, in an interview with Joan Gordon, states that she used music as a sort of universal solvent, physically speaking. Music dissolves the vampire's necessary self-control and discipline and renders him prey to his own buried savagery, his deep past. In the scene Charnas is referring to, Wayland is attending an opera and accidentally kills an actor in a fit of intense emotion and is then forced to hide the body. The opera awakes something in Wayland that he thought was long lost and buried. His feelings are both what connects him to his humanity and what pushes him to kill human beings. Dr. Wayland often preys on the weakest or most socially vulnerable members of society, so for example, women or homosexual men. By using his power as a vampire to take advantage of others, he highlights how it is our human nature to overpower one another. Uh, Wayland is able to justify his decisions to himself and even to Dr. Lander. Kathy Davis explores this connection between the socially vulnerable and Wayland. Wayland's commentary on both the historical state of women and the current subject position of gay men in Western society reveals his awareness of oppression and its consequences, an understanding seldom expressed in vampire texts authored by men. Furthermore, the vampire uses the phrase outcast themselves, indicates his awareness that he too is a fringe dweller. 
Waylon knows that women and gay men are the easiest prey because society has relegated them to the outskirts. They, like Waylon, are second-class citizens. Judith Johnson's article, Women and Vampires, Nightmare or Utopia, suggests that the abuse of power for which the vampire is a metaphor thus includes the abuse of women both as pop property and as tools in men's efforts to control and abuse other men. Whelan is confronted with the uncomfortable notion that his growing love for humanity is what will connect him as well as separate him from humans. At the end of the text, Whelan feels he is forced to go back to sleep. He cannot feel the same way about humans and therefore cannot consume them at his leisure. Upon the death of Irv and the subsequent tongue lashing Waylon receives from Irv's friend, he reevaluates his position on humanity. The friendship between Irv and Dorothea is the tipping point for Waylon. He says, "Until Katie de Groot, with one utter, with one utterly unlooked for, devastating stroke that had rent him open, mind and body, and left him vulnerable to these others." He remembered Flora's dazzled, growing awareness that she worked. At revelation with her client, first in words, then in flesh. He remembered Irv's dark, warm gaze, his voice low and concerned, and Dorothea's blazing with the anguish of having failed to save her friend. Not cattle, these. They deserved more from him than to sing, and they had more. With this realization, he chooses to step away from humans and their infectious influence and back to sleep. He concludes that his sleep will erase his humanity in these fragile new memories and thus give his waking self a fighting chance against humans who would hunt him. In his final thoughts, readers conclude that this is the cycle of Wayland. He is awake just long enough to find his humanity, and then he goes back to sleep. In putting Wayland to sleep, Tarnas is giving him a safe haven away from his would-be oppressors and the promise of another chance of humanity at a later date. Through the character of Waylon, <clears throat> Charnas assesses what it means to be genuinely human. <clears throat> he begins the journey a ruthless, arrogant killer and finds his humanity along the way. He is beaten down and treated as a drag of society and in his broken state finds the best kind of people. The essence of the text can be summed up in a simple phrase. The worst of times brings out the best of people. Wayland ends his novel by stating that he could not hunt successfully among prey for whom he might come to care. His life had been broken into. Anyone might enter. The Vampire Tapestry is a novel that generates opportunities to discuss the impact of feminist science fiction in the world of fiction, but also in the lives of those who read the text. Humanity infected Wayland, and sleep was his only hope for a cure. This is my works cited page. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, uh, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation.